a racial slur, or a recognition of history. The argument over Wichita High School mascot returns this week. Plus, pandemic era campaigning breaks down along party lines in Western Kansas. And the surge in mail-in balloting sparks a presidential suggestion of delaying the election. What do you think about the idea? That's what we're talking about right now on Kansas Week. Southwest National Bank has proudly served Wichita and its surrounding communities for over 100 years. We are happy to support KPTS, public television for Kansas. Pedraza in this is Kansas Week. We start tonight with a surge in mail-in balloting. The deadline to request a mail-in ballot was this last week. According to the Kansas Secretary of State's office, as of Friday morning, almost 315,000 Kansans have requested mail-in ballots. Election offices have already sent those out to voters. That's compared to the more than 53,000 mail-in ballots sent out by this time in 2016 almost a six-fold increase. And Kansas isn't alone. This week, President Donald Trump, who says he's concerned about the safety of mail-in balloting, raised the idea of delaying the election instead. Cake's Jamie Jackson takes a look at what Kansans think about that. On Twitter, President Trump made it clear he's concerned about mail-in ballots for the upcoming election, saying 2020 will be the most inaccurate and fraudulent election in history. It will be a great embarrassment to the USA and asking if the election should be delayed. But it's constitutional and the president doesn't have the authority to delay an election. I think there's a lot greater chance of fraud with mail-in ballots. Can Secretary of State Scott Schwab released a statement saying in part he does not agree with delaying the election and that secure measures are in place. Well, for me, I don't think we should postpone the election. Um, we're creating an environment to where we can adjust and acclimate and still do what we need to do if we follow the recommendations that the CDC is putting in place for us to keep everybody safe. The biggest hurdle to any delay would be a change of law dating back to 1845 and the Constitution, and there would have to be an agreement and legislation from both Democrats and Republicans. Voting is too important. We want to be here in person to vote. And we all know this topic doesn't end there, so let's get to it. Here on the desk with me today is Travis Mounts, Managing Editor of the Times Sentinel Papers. And joining us by Zoom is Dr. Neil Allen, Political Scientist from Wichita State University. Thank you both so much for being here this week. Neil, I'm going to start with you. The Constitution has some things in there. There's an act of Congress that would be involved. What exactly is the legal situation that would have to happen to change the date of an election? Well, the problem here is that President Trump just doesn't understand how our democracy works. And whenever you believe in things that you don't understand, you will suffer. And Trump is now suffering from members of his own, members of his own party and also uh, others that understand the Constitution saying that you really can't delay an election. And the congressional uh, terms are set to start in January. And also, our election system has functioned through the Civil War, through the Spanish flu pandemic, and World War II, and so it'll work just fine now. And, and certainly, we have seen a lot of different situations as we all deal with this. Mail-in balloting in Kansas is nothing new. We've been doing causeless mail-in balloting, where you don't have to say why you want a mail-in ballot, for years here. And there are a lot of safety precautions in place. We're seeing some of the rural counties actually having some of the highest rates of mail-in ballot requests. Yeah, I, I think that probably does reflect the, uh, the overall concern about staying healthy, especially in rural counties where you've got an older population. I mean, yes, very much this situation splits along uh, uh, party lines, but older people, I think, are very cognizant of the fact of how dangerous this disease is to them. I, I don't see any real problems coming up in the uh, integrity of the election. We, you know, the, this argument that there are problems with the elections, that there are, you know, threats to the legitimacy have never panned out anywhere in this country. It's just, it, it, it's a false argument. Uh, what I think we will see is difficulty in getting uh, ballots counted in, mm -hmm. in, in a time frame that we are used to. We may be waiting days or even a week or two for some places to finish counting all the mail-in ballots they're going to get. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I know Republic, 
the county of Republic <laughs> had over 25% of its people asking for mail-in ballots. And I know, Neil, you had some thoughts on that as well. Well, also, one thing about mail ballots we have to understand is that it takes longer to count them. And also, the system works slower in terms of counting on election night. But we don't need to know on election night who the winner or loser is. And there's a canvas that happens later. And while people in our business who like to analyze elections, we like to have information right away. But we don't need that kind of information. And President Trump seems to think that the American election system is supposed to create a winner within a few hours after the polls close. And that's really not how it works. And we can all just take a breath and wait a week till all the ballots come in. And when it comes to presidential elections, certainly wouldn't be the first time we've had to wait a bit. Uh, I yeah. remember covering the 2000 elections quite vividly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that one is a great example of, of just having to be patient. And I mean, that was not just, we don't know, but I mean, it was contentious. There were mm -hmm. lawsuits. Uh, you know, it drug on quite a while. And at some point, you do have to figure all that out. Um, but between election day and when we're supposed to swear in a new president and the, and the other officials in January, there's a lot of time in there to figure yeah. all this figured out and counted properly. Yeah, yeah. I, Neil, I've got one last quick question for you on this topic. Scott Schwab, the Secretary of State, has said that really Democrats are probably going to be returning more than mail-in ballots. They Certainly that's historically been the case in Kansas. But if we look at the ones who are requesting it, it is pretty much a 50-50 split. How, how do you see that playing out here, this, this selection? Well, Democrats, or at least Democratic-leaning voters, tend to request things later and do things later. That's one of the reasons why the Democratic vote tends to come in later whenever things are being counted. And we have to keep in mind, though, that the coronavirus has caused all kinds of dislocations in people's lives. And it's actually made a lot more important the efforts of parties and affiliated groups and candidates to try to get the message out to voters without being able to do so going door to door in common gathering areas like they would normally do. But I think the larger national dynamics will probably make a lot more Democrats vote by mail, if nothing else, because the leaders of the Democratic Party are not out there telling people that mail balloting is corrupt like President Trump is. Yeah. Well, well, I was going to say, you also have, you know, more Democrats living in urban areas, which tend to have higher cases and where, you know, play, people are taking the, the uh, pandemic a little, little bit more seriously as well. So mm -hmm. I think that's factors in. Yeah, and, and certainly that rural urban divide we're going to see kind of play out a little bit here in this next story because the pandemic is affecting how candidates reach out to voters this year and their reaction, at least in western Kansas, is falling along party lines. That's according to a Washington Post story this week. The Post said Republicans in general are campaigning the same as they ever have, pointing to a Republican meet and greet in Garden City Sunday. Masks were optional. Dinner was served from buffet trays and dozens of party activists sat next to each other at tables while candidates circled the room shaking hands. Representative Roger Marshall running for the U.S. Senate was at the meet and greet. He told the Post Kansans want to know their candidate in person, but added, it's hard. It's a conflicting message. In my heart, what is the right thing to do? Vicki Hyatt, the Kansas Democratic Party chair, told The Post what they're doing is irresponsible and they're putting people's lives and their own lives in jeopardy. In general, The Post reported Democrats are keeping their campaigns virtual, using things like Zoom meet and greets to connect with voters and wearing masks and gloves when they have to be in person. Chris Kobach, also running for the U.S. Senate, was campaigning in Seward County over the weekend, one of Kansas coronavirus hotspots. He told The Post most of those cases there were tied to meatpacking plants, adding many individuals working in the meat plant are living in conditions with six, ten people in a very small building. He said Kansas is cases per capita are half the national average. And a couple of interesting details in that article. One, remember that it did cover both Michigan and Kansas. We kind of pulled out the segments involving Kansas, obviously, for here. But really some interesting details uh, about Marshall and Kobach in there. Marshall said he's washing his hands 40, 50 times a day. Remember, he is a doctor. And Kobach made the comment that if I were in New York City, of course I'd be wearing a mask. And that really does come down to that rural-urban divide that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think what you're going to see is over time more 
this disease is going to catch up in rural areas, I, I feel like. Um, you, you look at the mayor of Scott City, who didn't feel like this was really a threat and now is recovering and, and has said publicly that he is, you know, rethinking at least his position on masks. Part of this is that um, just as Americans, we have a hard time thinking something is going to impact us until it really does or until it, you know, it's, it's hitting our neighbors. And so, uh, you know, things like this start in urban areas and move out to rural areas. So just buying into the, the danger of COVID-19 is going to take more time in rural areas because it's not personal yet. It hasn't hit there yet. Mm -hmm. And certainly while we're seeing that difference break down along party lines, is this really about party or is this about what the voters want, Neil? Well, I think it actually sadly is about party. And there's been some recent research that has shown that on the question of wearing masks and of social distancing, the big driver of whether people follow health recommendations or not is partisanship even if you control for other factors like whether they live in a rural area, whether they are male, and other things that tend to affect um, people's behavior in terms of social distancing. And it's just really scary what is going on because everybody matters. We all can get sick and we need to do what we can to help each other, including wearing masks like we all should be carrying all the time and wearing because, uh, you know, democracy is, is a wonderful political system and a way of governing ourselves and choosing leaders, but it shouldn't have to put people into danger of death and of illness. And talking about that, uh, certainly one thing that we have seen is it not necessarily bringing out the best in some candidates. There's a Democratic candidate in eastern Kansas who is trying to unseat a Demo sitting Democratic state representative. Can I get that all out in <laughs> one sentence? Uh, who has been on social media and made some comments about basically saying he hopes that Republicans continue to go around not wearing masks, get sick and die of COVID-19, or at least get seriously sick and can't vote because that will increase Democratic chances in November and Democrats across the state as well as Republicans are strongly condemning him. Yeah, yeah, and, and that response from both parties against what this uh, young candidate said, who I, I believe you said is 19 years old. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, that kind of rhetoric just is, has no place in politics. And that sounds very Pollyannish considering how much stuff goes in today's political scenes. But uh, uh, yes, this candidate definitely crossed the line and appropriately is uh, being chastised by people from both parties. Yeah. And Neil, I mean, this is a young man, 19 years old, who actually ran as an independent for governor uh, in the last election. How much of it do you think is perhaps his age? How much of it really is the kind of rhetoric that we've been hearing in the national politics lately? Well, there's a big problem to not so much talk just about age or youth. I think anybody of any age can do anything good or can do anything bad. But we have a real problem in this country that a lot of citizens spend so much time watching television and consuming media about politics. Now. It's kind of weird for me to say that because part of what I do is go on TV and talk about politics. But we have to keep in mind that democracy is not about one side, it's about all sides. It's not about uh, agreeing on who wins and loses, it's agreeing on the rules that govern things. And the rule should be that all of us will try to keep each other safe and also not use rhetoric that calls for harm to others as a way to stoke up our base and to get um, people coming out to vote. You can make plenty of arguments to get people to vote right now about how important their vote is in November 2020. And talking about uh, all of this changing as people get more accustomed to and have more firsthand experience with all this, we had the Scott City mayor this week who uh, didn't think COVID was real and now has been tested positive for it. You have uh, U.S. Representative Lee Gomer from Texas, the same thing. It's really starting to hit some politicians. Well, science doesn't really care what your political beliefs are. You know, na you know, na nature does its own thing, and you can either uh, accept the way it is or not accept it. But uh, uh, you know, nature's going to do its own thing. So. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, there are some other things that are happening that nature may or may not affect. Earlier this month, the Washington NFL team announced it was going to drop its controversial name after years of Native American protests. In the wake of that announcement, the Wichita School District said it would revisit its mascot name for North High School, but decided not to deal with it in the middle of a pandemic. 
The Wichita Eagle reports that the USD 259 school board has decided not to take up the issue of changing the name of the North High mascot until the COVID-19 crisis is over and the public can once again come to board meetings. The school board said it received 16 emails and letters on the topic evenly split between calling for a name change and arguing to keep it. North High alum Kathy Epps Hankins, class of 1963, wrote, I find it unacceptable that various out-of-state and or nationally known organizations are, again, trying to make decisions for the entire country. No cancel culture can truly erase history and reality. While Sherry Skillwoman, class of 65, wrote, It's time to discontinue this cultural insult and the psychological damage it causes to Native kids who grew up internalizing these caricatures of their culture. Drop the name and find a respectful way, including the Native community, to arrive at a new mascot name. School Board President Cheryl Logan promised the issue is only delayed, not forgotten. And full transparency, while I do not claim to be Native American, I do have Native American ancestry. And this is something, I am a member of the Native American Journalist Association, which has been very vocal in opposing the use of this word. You notice I will not use the name of this. I have Native American friends who have equated it to the N-word and other racial slurs. It is something that really brings on some very heated beliefs on both sides of the aisle. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, I have to admit, when I was a high school in high school, I was an Indian mascot, and uh, you know, it was the mid '80s. It wasn't something that we really gave any thought about. There, there really was minimal education out there, unless you really already had a desire to go find out more information. And so, um, you know, times are changing. Um, um, I, I would think at some point that not only will North High be looking to change its name, um, I think other area high schools that just use the name Indians will probably mm -hmm. um, want to make that change at some point. You know, my, I, I know that there are many emotions tied into mascots, um, but I would also ask people how many people still feel bad about the loss of the name Washington Bullets? <laughs> You, you or know, even nobody, remember nobody, it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, or how many people are upset that Kansas City doesn't still have the name A's or Athletics, that that name left when that team left for Oakland. Mm. No, no, we, we have our Royals, Royals, we love our Royals. Um, you know, these kind of, it, it's a very emotional topic, but, uh, you know, within a generation or so, nobody will miss those names once yeah. they're gone. And Neil, one thing that I noticed uh, as I was reading some of those statements is they really sounded very similar to some of the comments that we've seen as we've heard the arguments over the Confederate battle flag and Confederate monuments across the country. That's correct. And also we should note here the circumstances of the founding of the city of Wichita because we are named after the Wichita Native American tribe that was resettled here during the Civil War from Oklahoma briefly during the war because the Union uh, thought they couldn't be protected in Oklahoma from Texas raids during the Confederacy. And then the, the land was then transferred back into white uh, control and the Wichita Indians were moved back. And so we have lots of history here. We're just a couple of miles from the spot where uh, North High sits, where I actually drove past on the way over here today. It's a beautiful building and can tell an interesting and wonderful an important story about the true history of America from all sides. But the name itself um, is only used as a slur um, when it's talking about actual Native Americans. This is a this particular name is different than Indians or Braves or any particular name of a particular tribal group. It is it is just a racial slur. And our students deserve better than to be called that name whenever they're going to school and just doing the kind of things that kids do of learning and learning, uh, learning about academic work and, social, and socializing instead of being saddled with this history of oppression and genocide. And one thing that the uh, school board said about why they aren't taking up up now is because they want the public to be able to come to meetings and certainly as members of the media we we approve of that <laughs> oh absolutely uh you know for this to be a a successful effort really you need to have buy-in from a lot of different people and uh um there is definitely some logic to the that idea that we need to wait until we can until we can have do a better job of getting people engaged and be part of this conversation and finding a way to you know possibly honor native peoples in a way that isn't actually offensive to native peoples yeah.
Neil, I understand you have one more comment. Let's make it quick. We've got another story to get to. That's right, but as the parent of two children in the Wichita School District in different schools, I support the school uh, board's decision to delay this because they have extremely important things to work on to serve all the students of the Wichita School District. Uh, certainly, and we've seen those hour-long meetings that they've, as they've tried to dig through all the issues related to trying to get school open in the pandemic era. Well, we have one more story today. Should you be able to sue a law enforcement officer if he or she violated your civil rights? A legal doctrine known as qualified immunity might get in your way. KSN's Brett Boganski investigates why and what lawmakers are thinking should be done about it. The Supreme Court created it in 1967. Qualified immunity is said to balance two things. The need to hold public officials accountable when they exercise power irresponsibly and the need to shield officers from harassment, distraction, and liability when they perform their duties reasonably. However, it evolved over the years to allow lower courts to dismiss civil lawsuits without determining whether a constitutional violation has occurred, adding, so long as the right at issue was not clearly established. In other words, victims have to show there's a similar case to theirs with nearly the same facts the courts already heard to try and prove there's a clearly established violation, something critics say make it virtually impossible to hold officers accountable even if there's a civil rights violation. A qualified immunity should be on the table. We should debate it. It's not a law. It's not something that Congress passed. Over the past month, that's delicate balance. We heard from both Republicans. I was raised to respect law and order. And Democrats. There's no reason to have a different standard for a police officer. On where they stand. Something needs to happen. On qualified immunity. And we asked them this question. Do you support abolishing or limiting qualified immunity? Right now, I would leave things as is, and that qualified immunity helps protect those police officers, that when they are willing to go out and put their life on the line, a split-second decision, that they need that protection. Congressman Roger Marshall does not support eliminating or changing qualified immunity. He said police reform should remain a local issue within departments and within local municipalities. Marshall thinks departments should focus on better screening its officers and their mental state. Should it be limited? Again, the whole scope, um, I, I, don't, I don't have a problem doing it. State Representative Casey O'Hobison didn't commit to one side of the issue or another, but said the state needs to create a task force. Since this interview, Governor Laura Kelly created the Commission on Racial Equity and Justice. I'm one who's willing to have those conversations to try to find that, that spot in which we find good policy that protects law enforcement from frivolous lawsuits and reduces their ability to do their jobs. U.S. Senator Jerry Moran said he is open to those conversations about changing qualified immunity, and he feels there's several Republicans who are willing to have the discussion. I'm a supporter of leaving qualified immunity in place, uh, you know, provided the law enforcement officer follows their practices and follows the, the right procedures that they have in place. While Congressman you know, Ron Estes call, supports qualified immunity, he uh, did uh, add uh, there needs to be more transparency in law enforcement agencies, like one of the proposals in Senator Tim Scott's bill of tracking excessive force complaints against members of law enforcement. People that have been stubborn before and not really wanting change, hopefully this forces them into a place where they that we can work on a bipartisan um, issue. State Representative Ponka Wee Vickers says she plans on introducing some police reform bills next session, but wouldn't say what they entailed. We need to be able to take a look at it and say, what protections are necessary and what protections are not? Yeah, we need to revisit that for sure. And State Representative Jan Kessinger also feels departments have to do a better job holding its officers accountable, especially when it comes to excessive force complaints. Like Kessinger, Representative John Carmichael is open to changing qualified immunity, but added this. Somehow we will fix the problem by having changed the law. It doesn't work that way in human behavior. You, you have to make systemic changes in large organizations, and that is something that a politician cannot wave a magic wand and change. And opponents of changing qualified immunity say that eliminating it entirely would open up Pandora's box. But I have to wonder, wouldn't the addition that we've had in recent years of body cams and dash cams really 
solve a lot of the issues that qualified immunity was supposed to protect? Um, it's definitely one tool out of out of many t potential tools that, that can be used there. Uh, you know, I mean, police do need a level of protection, but so do citizens. Uh, the law and the courts are supposed to, you know, balance as best as possible the rights of all the parties involved, whether you're talking about policing or, or any other legal issue. You know, big picture, we should always be willing to take a look at our laws and our policies to make sure that they are doing what they were designed to do and to make sure that they are equitable for everybody who is impacted. Yeah, and, and certainly as we look at this, it's one of the big issues that activists want changed. But Neil, how much of a chance do you think that there really will be any change in qualified immunity, at least here in Kansas? I think there's a good chance there will be a change eventually, probably into the next calendar year, because we will probably get changes when the federal government acts. And I think with the fact that the Democrats look like they're going to be in a much stronger position next year than they are now in terms of seats in the U.S. Senate and the presidency, then there'll be a lot of uh, incentive to make some kind of deal in Washington. Uh, but also, this is one of the many issues that um, is affected by the larger coronavirus uh, um, crisis that we have right now. But it's really hard to get um, legislative bodies to act near an election year in a normal year, and this is far from a normal year. But I think, though, the George Floyd protests have put this on the national agenda, and there will be some kind of action within the next year or so. And as we look at the ranking of various different police reforms, there are a lot of them being discussed and tossed out there right now. How likely, where do you see this falling in the possibility of those different? Um, it depends on, on how things shake out in the election on a, on a federal level. Um, if we still have a, a very split uh, government in D.C., I think this will be something that will be handled primarily at the local and at the state level. All right. Well, Neil and Travis both, thank you so much for joining me this week. I would also like to thank our news partners at the Wichita Eagle, Cake News, and KSN News for sharing their materials with us. We'd love to hear what you think. Just email us at kansasweek at kpts.org with your ideas on these topics or suggestions for topics and other shows. For now, stay safe and have a great week.